Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for hitting that play button for another episode of the Hetty Coleman Podcast, where we sit down with fabulous people to have go win conversations. Now, go win is being consistent and doing the right things that allow for you to achieve the wins that you have defined for your life so that you can live out your greatest story. I want two things to happen with you listening to this episode. The first thing I want is I want you to learn. I want you to learn something. And then the second one is I want you to be inspired to take action. Okay. And so today, ladies and gentlemen, today, today in the building, today, just listen to me because I got to make sure I say this right. 2,000 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, not from Hawaii, but all the way from Hawaii, my man, David Skidmore. David, how are you doing today? Eddie Coleman, it is an honor to be on the podcast. I feel like I have officially arrived. Doing oh, great. Stop, stop. No, here, no. I'm <laughs> I'm watching you and I'm inspired from a di- you know, you have these people that you just watch from a distance and don't get to spend a whole bunch of time with. Uh, but you get to be inspired by the work they're doing. And that's one of the reasons I love social media or being having mutual friends who who, yeah. who share the stories of their friends and mm-hmm. we get to listen in and be inspired by each other. And so I think that is really, really cool, man. So I've been watching you, bro. Man, it means a lot because I feel like every person I talk to, Hetty Coleman comes up very quickly. The only thing that I regret today is not wearing my red socks. <laughs> I just forgot the red socks today. How, how did you go without getting your red socks? I think I'm just on jet lag. I mean, it's just, you know, for sure. post Hawaii. So uh, if, if, if any of the sentences are, are messed up today. That's that's, why. that's the reason. We're blaming it on jet lag. I hear you. I hear you. Find a reason. Blame it. <clears throat> now, uh, why were you in uh, Hawaii? Can you share? Or- yeah, yeah. I just wanted to take a little bit of downtime. Last year, uh, when I was in the winter months, I had just launched a business. It was difficult. You know, year one is difficult. And I remember January, February were cold and long. And I said, next year. If I have, if I have the chance, I'm taking a vacation and I'm going somewhere warm in those months. And, um, I was doing a little bit of travel for, for business. I happened to be in LA and I looked and I said, Oh my gosh, I think I can get to Hawaii quickly. Let's, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's how that happened. Yeah. That, that's good. So um, I have to ask, like, what was your favorite part? Like I, I have set like, when I was growing up, I felt like nobody could ever get to Hawaii. Like I never met anybody. Right. Now I now it seems like every other month or so I got a friend or somebody going to Hawaii. What what was your favorite thing about it? Okay. I think it was hiking Diamond Head. Oh. Like Diamond Head was a really cool hike. It wasn't crazy hard. Um, but it was it was beautiful. Um, it gives you a view of a lot of the mountain or a, a lot of the island. And then I I think that the other part um, had to be, you know, just being surrounded by the ocean, almost anywhere that, that you go, you have a, a view of it. Um, so I spent some time, uh, on the beach at Waikiki and then, uh, took a drive to, to the North shore. Oh, okay. And, you know, sometimes those waves are like 20, 30 feet high. They were only about 10 feet on that day, but it was still so cool. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Uh, scoot over towards the light a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Stay there. Right. Yeah. Right there. Right, That's right. perfect. Um, so it, it, it's Hawaii probably, what is it? Is it in your top five places you've been? Have you been a lot of places? Are you a big traveler? Actually? Yeah. I, I, I've had a unique opportunity to travel to a lot of places. I got to do a lot of travel kind of around college. I did a study abroad trip Okay. and it was a Pacific Rim trip. So we went China, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong back when it wasn't part of China, uh, like a, officially. And then that wrapped up in Hawaii. It was three months and five days. It was incredible. Um, <clears throat> and then spent some time in Africa uh, and then some time in, in Europe. So I, I, I did get some opportunities to, to travel. I didn't travel for about eight, nine years. Okay. Uh, and then the past couple of years, I've gotten to do a little bit more. Not last year, but. A few years ago, yeah. Yeah, was Hong Kong legit? Hong Kong is one of the coolest cities I've ever. Yeah, been that's, that's what I've heard. Yeah, it was. 
it was kind of like a big European city mm-hmm. uh, with an Asian influence. So, gotcha. you know, you, you have the, the British uh, influence there, but then you also have the, uh, the Chinese culture. Yeah. So I, I loved Hong Kong. Yeah, legit, legit. Now, talking about you, you mentioned work. What what kind of work do you do? Like, tell the people. Yeah, I have a business listening. called Leader Growth, and so at Leader Growth, it is designed to help people uh, overcome challenges, experience transformation. That's individuals, that's organizations, and so I do training, coaching, speaking. Uh, love to to be able to do that, and that's a little bit of why uh, I've been traveling the, this year. Gotcha. Yeah. How long have you been doing Leader Growth? I launched Leader Growth in January of 2022. Oh, okay. So a year into it, I've been working with people doing different types of leadership yeah. development. I past five, six years yeah. in different capacities. Uh, when I first moved here, I, I was doing some leadership development on, on my own, but um, that unfolded into a litany of different things. All that to say, I'm thankful to be out doing it on my own again and uh, getting to make some of that impact. That's yeah. cool, man. Yeah. What um, for for the people listening? I feel like we I have a little bit of an audience who are people who are yeah. entrepreneurs who are trying to do their own thing, mm-hmm. specifically around yeah. speaking, facilitating, coaching. Those yeah. kind of people are out there listening. I feel like what what would be your suggestion around getting started in that type of work? Like, what do you have some tips that you found to help you be uh, successful in doing that? You know, my first time going at it, I wasn't successful. Mm-hmm. And I think that that created uh, two things. One was a little bit of understanding of how the business works. Mm-hmm. Um, you learn a lot of times just by stepping out and failing. That The other thing that, that I did learn in the process um, is the importance of like rhythms and, and rest. Uh, and so a lot of times when people are launching, they don't have rhythms. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if they're solopreneurs. Yeah. And so making sure you have good rhythms, relationships, making sure that rest is an important part um, of your life from the beginning. I think it's, 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 it's really hard to make it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even feel like, I mean, I, I, I'd say business is going well currently, but I don't feel like I've made it yet. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. It's, yeah. Every, like one in 10 businesses makes it through year one. Yeah. And then I think year two, it's like another one in 10. Yeah. And like, I, I, I can't remember what the percentage is, but like most don't make it seven years. It's so low. Yeah. And so I, I, I think just like, um, it's that idea of like rhythms and rest. And then finally I would go back to that idea, to, to that idea of like identity. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, the first time around, I was so focused on trying to make it that I think I was moving past people and mm-hmm. I was rushing past people or I was always trying to sell something. Wow, yeah. And people feel that. Yeah. So like, you know, be you, be authentic, believe in what you do. Um, you're going to be incredibly, man, it's, it's difficult because like you're going to feel like an imposter half the time, yeah. especially early on. But there comes a moment in time when you write an invoice that's bigger than anything you wrote in the past. And like, when you do, you're going to feel a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. But then like, you're going to go to another point and you're going to write like a a bigger one. Yeah. And so instead of focusing on like, this is the biggest thing right now is like, where do I want to be in a year from now? And Mm -hmm. who do I want to become? So one of my mentors said this, he said, pray this prayer. Lord, make me someone who is capable of stewarding what you want to bring to me. Mm. And I think like having that mindset um, has helped me uh, probably approach with a little bit more open hands this time yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and hopefully a little bit more peace. But I, anybody who walked with me closely last year knows it was very <laughs> <laughs> well, you got through year one, yeah. you're going into year two, you're yeah. feeling good about yourself. So that's great. Like, I think just keep showing up and if yeah. having mentors and all those different people yeah. speaking into your life is a win for sure. <laughs> um, now, another thing that I know about you is you are an author, author, yeah. author, is that, yeah. Did I say? Author, author, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, talk to me about how many books have you wrote? I've written two, two. That's what yeah. I, th- I thought it was more than one. Um, 
tell me about that process and what it's been like. Like I always tell myself I'm gonna write a book someday. Yeah. But I don't know about that. But you know, I'm writing an ebook right now. Yeah. Is that the same? Do I get to say author or do you have to have it the author of an yeah. ebook? Or do- Follow what it is. <laughs> You're an author. <laughs> <laughs> When's it out? When's it out? <laughs> We're working on it right now. We're working on it right now. Really? Yeah, no. No, I'm giving it away. I got a sponsor for oh, it. Oh, I like it. Yeah, I'm, I got a sponsor. Let's go. I'm not asking for any emails or nothing. I just want to give it out. And it's all about starting a podcast and how to use it and Man. what it looks like and all that stuff. So, where can we pick it up? Uh, it's going to be on my website, heady.media. Yeah. Eddie dot media. Eddie dot media. Go All get it. You already know. You already <laughs> listening. So whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. No, I'm excited about it as well. Yeah. I, I hopefully it just some a tool to help people. I believe podcasts yeah. and sometimes we we think of it as growing this big audience, but man, it's really about. I think it's it's one of the easiest ways to find consistency and continue to put yourself out there on social media. Yeah. With the many different ways you can use the content. That and it it does something inside of you too. Like each rep. I don't know if you felt like this, but early on when I first started podcasting, and compared to you, I'm still very early on. No, you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're money. I, I think early on when, when I started, I looked and I was like, man, I want to um, I want to make this impact. I want this thing to grow at this level or, or whatever. And I was thinking a lot about like, I don't know, just like how I wanted to come off. Mm-hmm. like two people and then you get about seven episodes 10 episodes in i think crossing episode six was kind of like a, a threshold moment yeah um and it was it, it, it was a moment of getting comfortable with it yeah and once i got comfortable with it then the podcast actually started becoming really really fun yeah uh so i'm i'm excited though because i'm just on episode 34 uh-huh I can't wait <laughs> to get this podcast ebook. Give us the book. Hey. You said you said yeah, I might can still use that no, thing. I still can for sure. <laughs> Always learn. <laughs> no, I'm really excited about. It. I think it's going to be good, and uh, hopefully, it really does add value to people, which is the big the big thing. And I like that I partner with somebody to, to be able to yeah. deliver it, and not feel like I have to get anything in yeah. in return for it. But hopefully people telling their stories of how the book has helped them uh, do do things differently in the way they approach their marketing or their community engagement, all those great things. So, um, but, but back to your process in writing a book, yes. talk, talk to me about it because again, I know that people are listening yeah. like me who like, man, I want to write a book. I, I'm looking at writing a book <laughs> and I have other friends who've written books, but I find that each person has a different approach, different perspective, you know, some people partner with Ghost Riders or whatever it may look like. It's yeah. still their content. They're doing it. Talk to me about yours. First, tell us to both about both books and okay. then talk to yeah. us about it. First book, Unstuck, Turn Potential into Purpose. Um, release that in 2020. And then For Love with Joy, The Best Way to Live, The Only Way to Die. Uh, released that August of 2022. So a uh, pretty quick turnaround, I think, as far as like rolling out two books in, in that time, but what people wouldn't know on the backstory is uh, I tried to write five books uh, mm. before. One of them I tried starting like when I was 20, 21. I think I made it three chapters in, uh, tried another at like 24, made it like six chapters in. Eventually, like I looked at it, I was like, this sucks. I don't want, you know, but like I, I just kept trying and I, I, I blogged a lot over the over those years. Um, when I think about those, those books though, the process was, uh, in some ways very different. So like unstuck, I come from a family of, of people with strong, like our our family reunion is like strong declarative statements. That's what it is. It's just people who are like, I believe this. And I think I just had like a lot of views on life and business or whatever at, at, at the time. And I was writing, you know, I just uh-huh. started writing and uh-huh. then COVID hit. And so I was like, man, people are going to get stuck. And so um, working with the team at Nominee, they kind of help. Um, they helped me direct it. Uh, so once we saw that, that it was unstuck, then there was like a vision and perspective that, you know, it, it was driving things forward. And so um, 
that's what that process looked like for, for me with unstuck. I, I knew that crossing the finish line was going to be really difficult because I'd never done it. So I think like when you haven't done something, you're just wondering like, how do I get there? Yeah. Like w- when is it actually done? You don't know. Cause you haven't done it. Yeah. And so thankfully I've got a friend who's written a bunch of books. He was my editor on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would set, set the timer for 30 minutes and I'd write. Oh, okay. I've got a writing playlist. Uh, it's like 10 songs. Wait, you were listening to music and writing at the same time? I like to to listen to like instrumental stuff primarily. Mm. Um, and then, so I, I even had like a daily rhythm. I mean, like I would, I would set my laptop up and then I would turn on a diffuser and I would have like the eucalyptus going with it. <laughs> And then I would turn my playlist on and then I would take my, my phone and I would set a 30 minute countdown timer and then I would put it in a drawer in a different room and I would actually close that drawer. And then after that, I would come back and I would have nothing on, on my screen, no notifications and I would just write. You just go for it. Yeah. And sometimes like it was terrible. Yeah. But sometimes something actually happened. And so Unstuck happened in three months. For Love With Joy, I started writing that one and like, 2018 and that was a four-year process and so part of that was like writing it quickly um sometimes like at a starbucks or uh evoke or something like very emotional uh writing because it's around grief oh and yeah. you know all, all that and then like uh i didn't touch it again until after unstuck so i i probably wrote a rough draft on it in like six to seven months and then I didn't touch it for about two and a half years I was always thinking about it yeah yeah but I didn't touch it and then I came back and kind of rewrote it and then worked with with my editor again and so that was uh that was the process of getting that out now now when you're writing it do you start with an outline do you start with your chapters or do you start just writing and then you figure out chapters later yeah. Do you begin with the end in mind? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. Uh, because, like, then I follow, you know, all the leadership principles. I'm always curious. I'm like, like, do these guys actually do that? So here, here's my writing process. Is I start writing about something that I care about. Gotcha. And then I chase it. Okay. And I keep seeing, like, is there more there? Like, is this concept big Wait, enough? So, see, yours story? sound more like a movie. I love those movies <laughs> with people writing the book. And they're taking you through the journey yeah. of the writing the book. Yeah. You sound more diffuser, <laughs> setting up laptop. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, this is a movie. Yeah, this is a movie. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it's like, um, I think the best way I can describe writing, this is how I feel about it. Sometimes you write the book. But when the writing gets really good, it's writing you. Is that is that where you're going to leave that right? Just leave that right there. Let's not even go anymore. <laughs> it just begins to write. That makes sense, though. Like, you ever get in the rhythm of something, you're just like, oh, this isn't even me doing this anymore. It's yes. just Yeah, 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 yeah. But I also yeah. like that you said that you don't listen to, you listen to music uh, soundtracks. Like, there's no yeah. lyrics. And what that reminds me of, like, uh, uh, an artist being in a studio. Yeah. And they go into the booth, and all they hear is the music, yeah. and then they just start going for it. Yeah. You know, based on what... Yes. So I wonder if there's a rhythm along, like if I hear this song, like the music that you were listening to during that time, and I'm reading your book, you should provide the playlist of mm-hmm. what you listen to, and then ask people to read the book while listening to whatever the playlist is, and just see if they can... That'd be fascinating. That would be. I'm. I'm like. That really would be cool. Like if 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 that was like a re, like if that was pretty consistent. Like maybe not all the time, spot on. But if it's enough of yeah. you listening to whatever the same playlist or whatever doing your writing. Yeah. That would be kind of cool. So I I found that that music can help me get places that I can't get to otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know uh, sometimes when I was writing something really emotional or I knew it was going to be emotional. I would actually put something heavy on. Like I would put something that I knew could generate like more, uh, more of the deeper, like sad emotions Mm. because I don't naturally live there. Gotcha. So it it could help guide me to some of those places in the same way. Like um, if I'm wanting to write something very inspirational, 
Um, I might put on like something by Hans Zimmer, uh, you know, like maybe the Interstellar soundtrack or the Inception soundtrack or, you know, like if I'm trying to. These are movies my wife listens to. <laughs> <laughs> or watches that I say movies uh, my wife. Li- no, just literally she's listening to them because she'll turn them on and then start getting on her phone or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm she's listening little, to, she's what you literally doing, listening to a movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's like America in 2023. Did you watch the movie? No, I listened to it. How was it? I don't know. It was Top Gun. Great, great soundtrack. Maverick. Great soundtrack. So true. So true. I'm going to call my wife today and ask her, honey, what's the last movie you listened to? <laughs> <laughs> See what she said. That's so good. So, good. so now yeah. I'm, I'm listening to you. Leader, uh, leader Growth. Yep. Um, we talked about books, mm-hmm. right? You in before the books, you kind of talked about your podcast, podcasting. Yeah. Does the book and the podcasting feed into the work that you've done, the business, and how, how does that work, uh, yeah. or do they play off each other? Yeah, so I've actually had a few people reach out to me and say, "Hey, I'm I'm wanting to write a book. Like, would you guide me through? Would you coach me through?" Sometimes that's accountability. Sometimes. Part of what I'm able to do a lot of times is take somebody's idea, like first idea, and then um, based on their own story, based on things that that they're interested in, I can a lot of times help them guide to like a a bigger story, a bigger narrative in that. And so uh, that's not something I planned on having business in, um, but it's actually become something that I enjoy a a lot and I want to see more people write. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like looking at, okay, how how do we create like a full tool set for that, Mm -hmm. uh, for for the future. So uh, I, I think that the other thing is when you do write a book, it does create like a level of credibility for, for some people. Um, like all of a sudden, I remember, Eddie, this is funny. I remember I just released Unstuck uh-huh. and I, I was just having coffee with a new friend. That's what I thought. And we sat down at Iote. They looked at me and they said, so what was it like? And I was like, what, what was it like? <laughs> They're like writing the book. Oh, and I was like, <laughs> this is going to be wildly unsexy. <laughs> you know, like tell them about my diffuser and like, <laughs> like, and, and all of a sudden, like I started getting introduced though as an author. You know, and I think like when you have a thing, you know, like you have a podcast, like people just start kind of knowing you as like, actually you have like 10 podcasts, but you know, like (laughs) you become known connected to those things. So like when, when people see that it creates some sense of credibility um, that a lot of times crosses over. So unstuck has helped, like, especially if somebody's interested in, you know, growing uh, in their own leadership and their own personal development story, like um, that has generated business. And then I think for, for love with joy was, was a moment where, you know, some, sometimes people go, okay, you wrote a book. That's cool. But you wrote a second one. You yeah. know, they're like, Oh, this is just what you do. Yeah. You know? And so then you're like, oh, okay, well we got to be working on more. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have a third or fourth. <laughs> I guess now I'm going to grab the third and fourth book. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think, um, writing a book, having a podcast, and if you didn't have those things, but you were active on social media, I feel like they all kind of yeah. social media, podcast, book, all can kind of lead back to you having the opportunity to do things. Yeah. And they may not be specific to the business that you do, uh, but they yeah. all create opportunities for things like that to maybe earn uh, some cash or yeah. maybe to be able to be in front of people and add value to those people. Yeah. Like that's what I've learned. Like just I, I've been a, I've been invited to do things based on me just mm-hmm. talking to me sharing that I wear red socks every day. Yeah. Hey, would you come and talk to our group about the, the power? Red socks. The, yeah, <laughs> the, the power of being you know just whatever. Or people see me out in the community delivering red balloons. Hey, would yeah. you come talk about leaders, community leadership? You know, Amazing. and so those are the kind of things that when I listen to you, are I would feel would be the same for you in the in the sense of writing a book podcast or whatever yeah. the things you do but also i see you as a creative like when i was thinking about how i would mm-hmm. would um introduce you or whatever mm-hmm. i think of you as a creative yeah is that do you, do you see yourself in that in that space as well i appreciate that you asked me that um 
that's my favorite way to, to view life uh-huh. is creatively. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I'm a creative who's in the leadership world. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm very interested still in, you know, just different creative endeavors in, in the future, whether that's, you know, new events, conferences, film, uh, writing projects, music. I love seeing people create or, or, or just working with teams. I love uh, seeing people come alive in their creative process. Um, I like it when I get to play a part in helping unlock something creative inside of people. Mm. That's good. Yeah. Um, maybe you should help me write my book. Okay. Maybe you want to use me as a project and, and, Let's come out it. with come down with a, a conference and a book all around go in. Yeah. What do you think? You want to do it now? <laughs> <laughs> it's like outline it here. <laughs> you ready too. You're like, I can't even he's fired up, ladies and <laughs> If you if you're not watching, I think I when I saw his eyes when he said, You wanna do it right? I think he was serious. Like, let's go, <laughs> boy. <laughs> We have whiteboards and everything around here. I would love it. We might just do like an after podcast session or something. We can do it right now. (laughs) I think that this book should get out there, though. Like this idea, go in. Like there's a reason that like when I talk to different people that they trace um, a lot of what they do and who they know back to you. Mm. Whether that's through the, which you just reminded me of the, we tell stories that you did like yeah, yeah. a few years ago. Now yeah. you brought it back with, uh, with the, we tell stories podcast to, um, your, your, your name comes up as a person that people meet each other through, you know, I think mm-hmm. about people like Jansen Miller. Yeah. Uh, recently I, I got to know Hannah Schmidt. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you know, those are just two people that within, I, I think within, 90 seconds of talking to them both. Yeah. Hedy Coleman's name came up. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I definitely think it needs to happen because I'm getting old, right? And, like, I'm not that old yet, but I'm getting old. Like, it's not. You got to get to it before the sun sets. I, I said that my dad, my dad is, like, 70, and he's still, like, I show you my email. I'm like, yeah. dad, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's just still tossing ideas out yeah. there and, and wanting to do stuff, and I, and I know uh, other people like that. So, man, I love so I'm enjoying this conversation because I am too. Yeah. I, I love that you, because I do think of you as a, as a creative first. And I think about you being an author, mm-hmm. thinking about uh, the podcast, thinking about your business. Mm-hmm. When I think about you, that's the way that I see you. And it may be because of Corey white. Like when he talks about you, yes. I think the way that y'all originally were connected was in like a mastermind or a circle of some sort yeah. of you helping move people forward and whatever it was. Right. And then I think the next thing was maybe creative mornings is where I saw you the okay. next time maybe. And then we had coffee at Hoboken. But in those things, I've always just thought of you as somebody coming along people, mm-hmm. helping them in their creative journey, but then also leadership with solid things of that nature. Um, book, um, podcast, leader growth, events. Events also something that uh, I've been able to connect you yeah. with. And one of the those events is a well branded event, and which is TEDx. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are part of that, and, and, and get to host that, which is a really cool event. You get to bring people on stage and give them the opportunity yeah. to communicate something powerful, yeah. and you never know where that may take them, mm-hmm. right? Or are you in that? Why events? Let's just start with why events, and then you talk to me about five things around events. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that, but why? Why events? That's a great question. Okay, so when I was growing up, we lived in Utah and, you know, church of like 25. Okay. My dad is a, is a preacher, so every year he would take me to this conference. It was in Tulsa. Um, while there, like, the Lord just kind of grabbed hold of my heart, and it was at the conference. I think that that's actually like going back to it. Uh-huh. It was like at these conferences, events, like there were moments and the moments just kind of like they, they shaped my, my life in such a way that it was like, Oh, I want to do that. So that was, that was actually where I, I got interested uh, in doing public speaking. Mm. It was at some of those conferences. It was when I was like at church camp in, in the summertime, like something about that moment, that event, like things like that, that led into, you know, wanting to, to do this kind of stuff as, as well. So I think like looking back, 
it generated something inside of me that became insanely curious early on of like, how does that work? Yeah. And then as time went on, it was like, oh, I think this is a great way to be able to influence people. Yeah. It's not necessarily going to be the end all be all. And I think sometimes like that can be um, something that people measure their event on. That's not really fair to themselves. But did you create a moment? Did you help shift someone's uh, perspective, trajectory? Uh, And so as I went along, that's what I became more interested in is how do I um, leverage some of what I have? towards uh, events that that are making it an impact. So like when I was right out of college, uh, led a college ministry for three and a half years, we ran a very small conference called I Am Now. Uh, you now know, when you, when you say small, like what are we talking, 50 people? Yeah, 100? 50, 80, okay. 100 people. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was, it, it's like one of my favorite moments though. And part of it was, was people would give us feedback after it was like the conversations, uh, the, um, the speakers I, I heard, whatever it was, but we were able to like shape it. We were able to curate this, this moment and it was significant. And then people would say, is it coming back? When are we doing it again? And so that's my mind just naturally gravitated towards that. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. And, um, you are, you are connected to the TEDx. Like, what does that look like I, for people who like, man, how do you even get connected to the TEDx? Yeah. How does that work? What does that process look like? I always get yeah. like, how do you become a speaker of a TEDx? Yeah. Can you yeah. can you share some of that stuff with us? Actually, I'd, I'd be very happy to. Now, I do have to, to share this part. Uh, I have retired as of this year oh. from TEDx Oklahoma City. Okay. So this this was my, uh, at least as, as of now, I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll come back. But I I think it was just like, it, it was a great journey for four or five years, you know, be, being part of it. I got tricked into it. Uh, I don't mind saying that my friend, Brian Clifton one day, uh, was like, Hey, would you be interested in helping us bring TEDx Oklahoma city back? And I was like, can we do that? And he said, yeah, we, uh, I'm, I'm talking to, to them about licensing and stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, what are you asking me for? And he said, I, I was wondering if you'd help out some with, with the speakers. And, you know, he, he knew my background in speaking and, um, said, so w- would you mind helping guide some of our speakers? And I thought I was going to help like a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And then like six weeks later, I'm the co-organizer with Brian. <laughs> so <laughs> he always says, he's always like, yeah, I tricked him. It actually was like, I was like, I did not plan on like doing yes. that, that at that level and uh, ended up being an amazing experience. I was drawn towards it though, because uh, w- once we started um, moving towards the event, I thought it was a fascinating way to be able to connect ideas were spreading uh, in a city that was kind of in this unique up and like up and coming moment. Mm. You know, Oklahoma City really growing from like 2009, 2010, having this renaissance at that time. And then uh, I feel like 2017. I would hear people say a lot in 2017, there's a, there's a unique energy here, Yeah, you know? And it felt like even 2014, 2015, it was like, this is cool. But about 2016, 2017, 2018, it felt like Oklahoma city shifted. And so I felt like TEDx at that time, it was kind of like an event, a conference that had reached its time for a city that had reached its time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, now, in, in your in your journey of doing events and things like that, just kind of have asked you, like, what are the five things? Uh, and when we did our, our call, you, you mentioned five things to me mm-hmm. that um, – and here are the five, and then we mm-hmm. kind of go back over them. Who's got the keys? Mm-hmm. Number two was who's on the bus? Mm-hmm. Did you share your boundaries is number three. <laughs> I, really, I am so curious to hear more about that. Uh, do you have it times 1.5? Yep. And then did you surprise number five? Is, did you surprise and delight? Did you surprise and delight? Yeah. All right. Let's go down these one at a time. Yes. Speak to me about it. Okay. The first one is who's got the keys? Talk to me. Yeah. Can I can I set it up by by giving four questions first? Yes, yeah, you can. Okay, so I I think anytime that you're looking at an event, you got to be able to answer four questions. And if you can't answer these questions, 
the following questions aren't really going to be significant. So number one is what's the purpose? Uh, sometimes when people have never identified what that is for a thing like TEDx, they actually do. They say it's an idea worth spreading. This event is created for ideas worth spreading. So the entire day is built around that. Secondly, what is the win? If you are like doing an event, let's say, and, and you know, the win in your mind is we're going to have 2000 people there. Why is that your win? Yeah. You know, like, is it clearly articulated? How do you know that you succeeded? If you don't know how you succeeded, uh, a lot of times you're wandering in the dark and your team is really confused about why you're making decisions that you're making. Mm -hmm. uh, three, who is it for? Like, if you haven't defined this is clearly for this person, this is the audience that it's for, it's very difficult. Um, and then four, how do we make it unforgettable? And so I think like, when we talk about those things, those kind of guide, those would under underpin all of the other points that, that I want to talk about as far as like these five essentials. I, I, I guess those four questions to me are almost pillars. Yeah. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump back in. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's good. And I love, I love that you set it up with that because oftentimes we can go, I, for, let me just say me, yeah. I can go into something and I have not asked these questions, which are all great questions. Yeah. And I just go with creating the event. And then yeah. it's like, just everybody show up. Right. But it's oftentimes it's cool if everybody shows up, yeah. but it's also good to be able to target who you're going after mm -hmm. in the end that if everybody shows up, that's great. Yeah. But you do want to have a target in, in understanding your win. Um, so great questions. Who's got the keys is the first one. Yes. Okay. So, Who's got the keys I think is essential. If you're doing an event and you don't know who has the keys, you're in trouble. So like for TEDx Oklahoma City, Brian Clifton has the keys. And that's how that's worked. Yeah. Since he came back, you know, it, since he essentially brought it back. Originally, Ken Stoner had it. Ken handed it off to Brian. What that means is at the end of the day, like we know who we're going to ask if we run into uh, – into different situations, gotcha. into different challenges. I'm gotcha. the co-organizer, but I know like, no, if we have like a, a financial thing, Brian has the keys on that. Gotcha. If we have um, a sponsorship, if we have like a creative element that, that we're looking at. So I think sometimes like we go, well, we're just going to have like a team of leaders. I heard somebody say this once, follow me works, follow we doesn't. Mm. And so like knowing this one person has the keys yeah, when like they're that. consistent, you can trust them with it. And so like you want to know that, that that person has it uh, operationally. You want to know that the administrative things are going to happen because when people think event, a lot of, you know, for, for anybody who attends, they think day of. Yeah. 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 Day of <laughs> is like 10%. Right. I mean like, if that, yeah, I mean, like if that, like you spend months working on this thing, yeah. you're spending all of this time. <laughs> Yes. And if you have somebody who keeps going, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the keys. Yeah. You're in trouble. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, thankfully, the person who had the keys from the beginning um, was the one who was inviting people in. Mm. But I, I, I think like having somebody who has an operational mind yeah. is really essential. So Brian invited me in. For other people, they're going to launch something uh, for the visionaries out there. You need to be really careful on this when you have an event, because if you don't trust somebody with the keys, your event's going to fail mm -hmm. or you're going to burn yourself out yeah. and your team out. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure uh, if you are building an event that you have a good ops person, usually ops team that you're uh, consistently communicating with and making sure that all of the things that are getting done are getting done. And we have had on TEDx Oklahoma City amazing administrative people. Uh, I, I can't go into all of the names, but at the end of the day, you got to know who's got the keys. You got to know who's got the keys. Yep. I like it. All right, number two was who's on the bus? Mm. Yes. Who's on the – what book is that? Oh, Good to Great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good to Great. So uh, it, it they do a great job of – I guess it's Jim Collins. But Jim yeah, Collins, yeah. Makes a great point you want to make sure that people are sitting in the right seat yeah. on the bus, right? First question is who's even on the bus? Because when you run like a TEDx Oklahoma city, um, it's volunteer based. It's all volunteer based. Okay. So nobody's getting paid. Yeah. 
which means um, you don't necessarily uh, have full say on who shows up. So you want to know like who's here and then as quickly as possible um, start bringing people into different teams. Sometimes somebody's going to say, I feel like I would be really good on this team. They might be good on the, uh, you know, event hosting team, on the hospitality team. Sometimes they're, they're going to be a little bit better in, in some other areas. Um, so here are a few things that I would be asking about who's on the bus. Okay. One, do you have the plug? Like, you got to have people who are mass connectors. Uh, like, they are going to connect you to, um, to sponsors. They're going to connect you as well, like marketing-wise. Gotcha. Um, do you have the plug? Uh, two, who handles the books? Okay. Like, we talked about that on, on the offside, but we got to dive in even more. Like, you want to know where, where the books are. You want to know that that's taken care of and that you have somebody who's competent specifically in that area. Uh, who's got the fireworks? Uh, <laughs> when you're like running a grassroots event, it's likely like on year one, you don't have a big marketing budget. Uh -huh. And so like, how are you actually going to get the word out? Oh, and you know, like good. you got to have something that's going to yeah. sizzle, that's going to bang, that's going to pop. Uh, I, I like this one is, uh, asking who breaks the glass. You know, the, there, there's a moment it's like in case of emergency, break glass yeah. <laughs> who does it because yeah, <laughs> you're gonna have like, emergencies do you got some examples of what yeah. so like it um a day or two before on our first one we found out oh by the way you have to have like uh a permit to allow oh, you know boy. people to like do stuff on, on the street on 23rd street we didn't know yeah <laughs> <laughs> like I guarantee you, first time on an event, you're going to find out everything you don't know. For and sure. so you got to have somebody who, like, this is your GCD person. They get crap done. Yeah. And in emergency, break glass, they, like, they will run through a wall for you. Yeah. Good thing good. is Oklahoma City is a, a little bit smaller, so, like, as far as connection. So you can, you, you can usually get, get in touch with somebody. Uh, who's got Southern Hospitality? Oh. Just because somebody says, yeah, I, I want to be on the hospitality team. You, you, you got to ask questions uh -huh. and more importantly than than just saying like do you want to like make sure that we have refreshments or you know th things like that what's the heart mm -hmm. like finding out what what the heart is who's got the brand if you don't have like a clear strong brand now tedx has its own brand but each event has its own unique brand each year ha has its own brand and so mm -hmm. you know having copywriters uh having a team of, of visual artists that's very important and then finally um, who are your translators? And I say this, like, this is essential. This is probably the part that I play. Uh -huh. Um, the translators are able to work between the operational side and the creative side. Gotcha. And I think that that's where my skill is, is I can help like the business people and the creative people understand each other. Uh -huh. And so a lot of times I, I, I sit very quietly in a lot of meetings. Yeah. But I'm trying to trying to find like where are we not understanding each other? Yeah. Um, the creatives a lot of times like to hold the cards really close to their chest, and sometimes it's because they're creating in process, but sometimes <laughs> it's because it's very personal. Yeah, and they don't want to share it yet. The problem is that the ops people have been going for maybe you know six months, like building different things in, in the background. And they want to know, like, what am I building for? Mm. And so to keep them energized, you got to have that cross-pollination. You have to have that communication uh, so that they understand each other. And so I think you have to have translators on, on a team when you're working like this. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Now, when you came up with the thought of the translators, mm -hmm. like, was that kind of based on somebody saying it to you? Or did you just kind of come up with, like, oh, this is kind of the <laughs> role I'm playing. I'm translating for these people. Like, I'm trying to get them to understand each yeah, other, be able yeah. to communicate well. I really like that. I just want to make sure that I coin, when I when I use it, I can give you credit. Or Yeah, I remember uh, one of my friends back in Tulsa, Big O, uh, he does a lot of stuff around Strings Finder. And Big O one, one time was like, you got a good team there, but the problem is you don't have very many translators. Uh, and then he told me, because I was out front in, in this situation, he said, you're, you're in a position at this point where you can leave everybody behind because um, you, create, you create vision in your head mm. and you do it really quickly. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah the yeah, problem yeah. is if you don't communicate it to them, if you don't translate that well, they can't buy in. Yeah. And so I've learned as time goes on, and I, I still feel like I'm learning on this one, is to get as um, get as colorful, get as specific, get as detailed as you possibly can around the creative elements, mm. around what is happening. Um, that's difficult to do, especially if you don't have it all worked out in advance. Yeah. And some of us, sometimes our best ideas come later. Yeah. And so sometimes like in, in the moment, it's like, we're working on that. Wait and see. Um, here, here are some of the things we've done in the past. And yeah. you can sometimes give, give a picture if the vision isn't fully there yet. Yeah, yeah. no, that's good. That's really good. Man, that's important to have. And, and that that almost um, feels as though if something didn't work out well in mm -hmm. the past could be the key reason it didn't. Mm -hmm. Because you have these two different people who are aligned, are coming together mm -hmm. to do this thing, but it's hard for them to to hear each other clearly because they yeah. don't have anybody they're translating. Yeah. I, I think a lot of times within a team, sometimes like the creatives will – the creatives might say something like, man, I just feel like they're really prying in mm -hmm. to my space and like they're trying to control it. Mm -hmm. And the ops person isn't necessarily trying to control it. They're trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. the, their, their mind a lot of times, a lot of the ops people I know, their mind works in the Excel uh, spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> their mind works really well in details and documents. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, one of the things that I've done sometimes with creative people is say, I want you to write through this with as much specific language as possible. Yeah. Or I want you to uh, record this. I want you to, um, we, had, we had one of our team members, Britt Portry, that this past year, she walked through the entire thing on, I think it was on AutoCAD. Yeah. It was this incredible experience. I'd never seen this creativity at this level. I knew that the idea was good. I didn't know where it was going until I saw it. Oh. And so having been on both sides, I think helped me understand, oh, this person isn't prying. This person is simply wanting to understand. Now I'm that person yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, as, as, as your role changes and as you have more people come, come on board, like you end up moving from a role of like creating a lot of things uh, to creating fewer things. Yeah. And, and hopefully unlocking the creative potential inside of each person so that that comes out more and more. But you got to have them translate. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Number three, did you share your boundaries? <laughs> did? Should <laughs> yeah, I should look at the look, camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a relationship <laughs> talk. <laughs> okay, here we go. Did you share <laughs> your boundaries? I love it. Henry Cloud says this. As a leader, you always get what you create and what you... <laughs> Let me try that again. As a leader, you always get what you create and what you allow. Mm. So if something isn't going the way that I want it to go, it's usually because that's how I created it and yeah. that's what I've allowed. Yeah. This is what I notice. A lot of the drama and frustration that happens on teams is when the leader didn't set the boundaries up front. So sometimes we just come in and we say things like, well, let's just think outside the box. And people are like, great. And they think that that's what it is the entire time. Yeah. And with that, I don't have to be accountable to this team, to anybody else, because you just said run with it. Yeah. The challenge is that usually that leader has a pretty good idea of what they want. Mm -hmm. And so there's a framework. Yeah. Did they communicate it, though? And if you don't communicate it, like you end up in a world of trouble yeah. because you're like trying to figure out how to make, you know, everything come together now. Yeah. And, you know, simple as I thought we were doing apples. I thought we were doing oranges. Well, it's because all you said was we're, we're going to have fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so more clarity, more specific, more specificity. Did you share your your boundaries? And I like to, to use like a different idea, which is think inside the box. These are the boundaries. As much as you want to build in the sandbox, you can build. Mm -hmm. But like, these are the parameters of the sandbox. Because yeah. if you don't set those early, 
it's actually unfair to the people that you lead. So most of us have the expectation. If we don't, we need to spend some time thinking through it. If we don't have clear thought on that, we need to have a, a thinking partner and walk through some of this in advance and say, these are some of the boundaries that, that we do have. And I think as, as we go, we find that the boundaries are a blessing because the boundaries don't restrict creativity. The boundaries end up unlocking it. The boundaries end up helping people focus in even more on what's possible within this small space. What's What can I do within this area instead of focusing on, you know, all the real estate I could take up. Now, yeah. this is your zone. Focus in on that. Yeah, that's good. That's good, good, good. Uh, a thinking partner. Mm-hmm. So is that like a coach? Could a coach be considered a thinking partner, like somebody to help you think things through? Or? Could be. Yeah. Um, Ideally, ideally, it's a relationship uh, like BC, Brian and I have um, working on TEDx together. Okay. The cool thing about Brian is Brian is an ops guy, but at the same time, Brian's highly creative. And so like a lot of our best moments um, have come from Brian's mind. Gotcha. He, he thinks holistically, but he thinks very strategically. Um, I also think Brian's probably more of a tactical thinker than, than I am. Um, so I might sometimes play, I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking through, through this off the top of my head now. I think sometimes I, I'm like, my mind probably works a little bit with like nuance, like, you know, what, what's the flow in the moment of like people going on stage, musicians, things like that. I think Brian's really able to kind of like capture this is where I want the audience to be at this moment mm. in the day mm. because of where we're going at this point. Yeah. Being able to have those conversations um, over the past four years, I think for both of us has been very helpful because it's not just like one person on an island or you yeah. know, trying, trying to figure it out. If, if that was me just trying to figure it all out, um, it would have been a problem. Yeah, I, I, I think that having thinking partners – which ultimately goes back to, do I trust this person? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Okay, here's the next one. Do you have it times 1.5? Yeah. Do you have it times 1.5? This is what I've discovered. Um, when we're getting ready for an event, you got to do everything one and a half times what you're expecting. Mm. So the creative element like I, I actually like to ask people, okay, if you were going to do that and it was going to be two times bigger, if it was going to be four times bigger, what would need to be true? Mm. It starts making them think about it differently. It also begins to, um, our, our minds a lot of times begin to think, I, I think a little bit more from a, a mindset of, um, of resource and abundance instead of lack. Mm. So sometimes when we simply go off of, who we have currently people wise, we go to our closest friends because that's the easiest call. I need more volunteers. We need more people in hospitality. So let's not just set the table with, you know, if, if, if we need 10, like 10 people in there, if we need 20 people, let's not ask for, for 20. Like we need 30. Yeah. Because some people are going to call out. Yeah. Invariably people will call out. Um, as far as, you know, any creative element, whatever you're doing, add one and a half times to it. Like, it's just going to take longer than, than you think it's going to. Gotcha. Like every aspect in the, the larger that the event is, I would add more margin Yeah. as much as you can, but one and a half times on people, one and a half times on, you know, anything video related, anything creative related. If you think you need um, this many people on stage at that time to help you set it, you yeah. need more. Yeah. 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 No, that's good. That's good. Um, do you surprise and delight is the fifth one. Do yeah. you surprise and delight? Yeah. I got this question from um, the guys at Willow Creek Conference. I got to spend about two hours talking with with one of their primary team leads a couple of years ago. And this is what they bake into everything that, that they do is this idea of surprise and delight. And so like, you know, I, I showed up at an event that they did and they had, um, they had the, these jackets for us 
um, they had our, our name tags, but the name tags didn't have like that, that thing where, you know, it needles through or whatever. It was like magnetic. And I was talking to, to them after and they were like, yeah, we didn't want to tear up shirts. And then also, um, the reason that, that we had a jacket in there is because we got your size in advance when you signed up for it. Mm-hmm. Now you didn't know, yeah, 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 yeah. but we wanted to surprise and delight the 300 people who were going to be at this dinner. I thought that that was like a brilliant, brilliant yeah. mindset. So uh, one of the things that, that we try and do is take like in, in any event, the power of, of moments. People remember moments. People mm. remember uh, vacations. Yeah. People remember conferences really through like two things, the peak moment, the ending. And so, you know, like, okay, so what, one of our best moments is our first year, 2019, Rhonda Bear, uh, formerly incarcerated, and uh, now runs like multiple coffee shops. Uh, she has this incredible uh, restoration ministry of bringing women uh, out of prison. Brian has this idea of what if we get the governor to uh, congratulate her via video? And what if, what if he like made it Rhonda Bear Day in Oklahoma? And so both of those things happened and it happened at the end of the day. Sean Askinosi was, was speaking it as well. Askinosi chocolate. Everybody had Askinosi chocolate under their seat. Like it created a moment at the end where it was like, you know, everybody's celebrating. Everybody's like, Oh my gosh, like, this is amazing. Look, like we're seeing that this woman who has gone through so many different things. And now like, this is her day (laughs) officially. This is like a moment in Oklahoma history. We're all part of it together. Yeah. It meant something. Yeah. And so like harnessing those kind of moments so that when people go, Oh, this was unforgettable. Yeah. You were surprised and delighted. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah, no, that's good. And and that is some that take that requires some thinking. Like that's not gonna happen. 30 days out, maybe like maybe from the starting at yeah. the beginning, especially if you want to work with the governor, mm-hmm. you got to get all the video recorded. Mm-hmm. You got to have it all set up. You even got to know that she's speaking like this yeah. is like something that happens right away. It takes time to develop and, yeah. and have your thinking mm-hmm. partner talking these things through. Yeah. And so what I'm hearing is like it takes a lot of to be a great event. Mm-hmm. You have to be super intentional. You got to give yourself space mm-hmm. before the time of the event and, you know, yeah. the beginning, right? And then also mm-hmm. it sounds like there's a lot of thinking as far as how you want to see the end go, mm-hmm. right? You're yeah. saying you have the speaker, then you have the governor, like, wrapping up at yeah. the end. That surprise and delight, mm-hmm. like, oh, my goodness. How yeah. how cool was that moment? Like the key yeah. that Taylor Doe gave. Yes. Everybody got a key, I think. That's, yes. that's right. And so people were – that was a moment that was talked about. It, to this day yeah and even created like on there and then moments right yeah, yeah like and so you can be this for others that talk i think has become like it's one of the mo- two most talks two most watched talks that tedx oklahoma city has ever had mm. it's just blowing up because yeah. it's tapping into something um which is a better story and yeah. i i think that that's ultimately what people want what events can do is it can help people live a better story uh, and remind people like, no, you can play a part. Uh, and, and hopefully that's what an experience like a TEDx Oklahoma City uh, is ultimately able to do. Yeah. And, and again, just kind of going back how people can see events benefiting them for their yeah. personal brand, their business brand. Mm-hmm. Like you 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 may be a, a co-organizer or whatever, yeah. but you also benefit from this mm-hmm. from this directly as from your business and brand, mm-hmm. do you see events as something, and they may not have to be the size of a TEDx, but do you see something as as far as creating events for your business or your brand being important? It's a good question. I'm looking at it currently. Yeah. I think events, I think events do something really special today. Like, because so many people were isolated for a few years, then we kind of had an event rush. (laughs) And so people rushed back in, uh, it seemed like into a lot of events, like every 
company that could have like their, yeah <laughs> you get people together we're yeah, doing it admit, like, <laughs> no more no less for lost time and so yeah. it was like events went crazy and i think like now we're kind of finding what what's the new era and so i'm i'm curious about what kind of events will will end up happening because the, the one thing i do believe uh is events give us an opportunity um, to think different and to meet people that we wouldn't have otherwise met, mm-hmm. which is one of the huge components of TEDx. Yeah. Like it's not just about speakers. In fact, some of it's about speakers. Most of, of the day is built for who are you going to meet? Yeah. 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 That's good. David, thank you so much for all of this goodness. Uh, thank you. It, it's always a pleasure to be able to sit down with you and, and, and chop shop. Uh, those moments that I get to, I run into you somewhere and have a quick conversation. And so uh, thank you again for this moment. Uh, any, where, where can people find you? Uh, you got anything coming up that people should know about? Hopefully we will post this by the time that happens. Yeah. If it's not tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you can, you can find the uh, information for, for leader growth at leadergrowth.us leadergrowth.us and then you can find me on social at I'm David Skidmore we will be releasing some some stuff as the year goes on one thing that people can do if, if they're just wanting to, to jump in and grow if they're in the Oklahoma City area um, is they can jump into a leader growth group uh, and so that that's one way that we love those because it's developing leaders two hours at a time uh, mm-hmm. but that that's one way to, to track with us and then here in, in the future i'm sure we'll, we'll have some stuff coming out soon that's legit yeah. Le- uh you said leader growth groups yeah leader growth groups. and uh, we, we found those at your website leader growth dot us yeah and you, you can also drop us an email at hello at leader growth dot us and just say yeah. i want to be in a group yeah. are these are these uh in-person groups zoom groups facebook groups currently in person Okay. As time goes on, we might do Zoom. Okay. Really love the in-person format. Though. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Got you. Well, again, thank you, David, for uh, hanging out with me and sharing your wisdom, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for hitting that play button for another episode of the Hetty Coleman Podcast. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, as always, go win. Go win. <laughs>